Well, good morning. I'd like us to turn, please, if we could, to the book of Revelation, chapter 19. I'm going to begin reading in verse 11 down to the end of the chapter. Revelation 19, verses 11 down to verse 21. We're looking at the part two of the two suppers. And we've looked at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to be looking at the supper of the great God in this particular chapter. And so beginning in verse 11, it says, And I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And God again will bless that very sobering portion of the word of God to our hearts today. Well, we're... Looking uh, at judgment on earth, we had seen joy in heaven in the first half of the chapter uh, where the marriage of the lamb took place. And then from there, the marriage supper uh, would follow on the earth. But now we're looking at judgment on the earth, what we said, the supper of the great God. And in a sense, it's the climax of the book is reached. Uh, all the previous events that we've looked at have been moving step by step to this moment. It's the consummation of prophecy. And I just want to, again, just emphasize this, that this is, the, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for the Lord's glorious appearing to the earth uh, to judge and make war. So uh, just look back at, again, some other scriptures, just showing that this is the climax. Revelation 1 and verse 7 it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And then please, if you'd look with me, I just want to show these various scriptures, Zechariah, uh, the culmination of all of these things that prophecy has often spoken of and now about to occur. Zechariah chapter 14 and verses three and four. It says, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. There shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, half of it towards the south. And then please, Matthew's gospel, uh, just chapter 24, we've, we've brought out quite a number of parallels between the Lord's 
Olivet Discourse and the Book of Revelation. And again, we see another parallel here, Matthew 24, verses 29 and 30. <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 29, where we read these words, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then one more scripture, just tying all these pieces together. Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians and chapter 1 and verses 7 and 8. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 and 8, where we read this. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so really, this is the climax of his history. The rebellion of earth is answered by the revelation from heaven. And it's a crisis on earth, right? There's a crisis that we, really we've got Psalm 2. Just turn there, please. I know I'm making you look at a lot of scriptures, but it's just amazing how much is coming together at this significant moment in the history of the world. Psalm 2, uh, why do the heathen rage? The people imagine a vain thing. Kings of the earth set themselves. Rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. And so while the world is coming together in one, in unison, to fight against the Lord and his anointed, here is the revelation of the Son of God from heaven to destroy these that oppose and so it begins in verse 11 of, of our chapter chapter 19 with these words i saw heaven opened now we already saw heaven opened in chapter 4 verse 1 if we remember back then many moons ago after the church age we'd gone through in chapter 2 and 3 he says after this i looked and behold the door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was, it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I'll show thee things much which must be hereafter. And so we had the door opened in heaven in Revelation uh, chapter 4. After the church age had run its course, Revelation 2 and 3, and there's this trumpet come up here. That's what we call the rapture of the church. That's And so in, all, in order for these armies to come out of heaven part of the army we're going to see is angels the other part of it is going to be the the redeemed saints and so to come out of heaven they have to go into heaven and they went into heaven in chapter 4 verse 1 at what we call the rapture of the church now once again heaven is opened and he says behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he did judge and make war and so we said there's a sense which everything before this in the book of Revelation is an introduction to the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And of course, heaven opens and he is going to be unveiled. He's going to be revealed uh, as he comes in glory. He returns to the earth in power and great glory. And of course, we saw in Zechariah when he comes, he'll come to the Mount of Olives uh, in Jerusalem. And the scripture uh, back in Isaiah 64, where we have this, this amazing uh, statement, I'd like you to turn there, please, Isaiah 64 and verse 1 and 2, and we read these words uh, where the, there's uh, this cry uh, that God would come down. And so he says, Oh, that thou would rend the heavens and that thou wouldest come down, Isaiah 64, verse 1, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. Well, in a very real sense, when the Lord comes from heaven, he's going to come to the Mount of Olives, and the mountains literally will split in half and melt at his presence. 
and his presence will be evident on the earth, and the nations will indeed tremble at his presence. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Often we pray that for revival, when his presence would be felt very real. But but the ultimate fulfillment is the heavens are going to be rent, and he is coming, and his presence will definitely be felt on the earth. And of course, uh, prayer is going to be answered at that time. The Jewish people who have managed to survive the tribulation, as we know from elsewhere, are now surrounded by armies. And the Antichrist is just one step away from achieving the final solution. And so at that moment, uh, God, uh, again from Zechariah chapter 12, he gives a spirit of grace and supplication to the nation of Israel. And part of that spirit of supplication is they're going to be praying. And what they're going to be praying is, the word that was once said when the Lord Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt, the fall of an ass. Remember, they said, Hosanna, save now, save now. Well, they're going to say it again. And this time they're realizing unless the Lord saves them. Now, they don't expect it to be the Lord Jesus Christ, but they're asking God to save them. And so they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, save now, because they realize it's all over. If God doesn't intervene at this particular moment, it's all over. And the Lord Jesus had said back in Matthew 23, 39, I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And at that very moment, the Lord Jesus will come from heaven to, to answer the cry of his people, save now, save now. He will come and defeat the enemies and save that remnant of Israel. And of course, they'll look on him whom they have pierced. What's interesting is we think of the Lord's first advent and when he died on Calvary. Uh, Paul says in Acts 26, 26, that this thing was not done in a corner. It was a very public thing. Uh, he, he was uh, watched as he hung there on Calvary's cross. And so Paul would say, uh, for the king knoweth of these things before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. Well, his work of redemption wasn't done in a corner, and his work of vengeance will not be done in a corner either. As we've already said, every eye shall see him. Revelation 1 verse 7. And what exactly will they see? Well, it says, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. Con what a contrast to his first advent. Do you remember how he came on a colt, the fall of an ass? Uh, kind of, he came in humility. Uh, and now he's coming riding a war horse. This was the, 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 the Roman triumph uh, triumphal procession uh, when a Roman general would come back from some victory in foreign lands he would often be riding a white horse a war horse leading behind him all his captives and so here's the Lord Jesus coming to conquest coming for victory and so he rides this war horse and notice it says and it's a white horse and we're going to see quite a, re a number of references to white here he's gonna he's coming on a white cloud uh he's gonna sit on a white throne a great white throne and all of this indicates the righteousness of his cause everything he's gonna do is gonna be done in perfect righteousness he is the one who is spotless holy and he's gonna judge in perfect righteousness and so he says i saw heaven open behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true so during um, his sojourn here on earth he was faithful to god uh, his father in completing the work that his father had given him to do i always do those things that please the father he was totally faithful and he was true he said i am the truth uh, everything he did was according to truth everything was done according to the reality of his own nature and yet he comes and and the reason it mentions faithful and true is that he's coming partly not only to judge a rebellious world 
but he's coming specifically to judge the beast and the false prophet. We're going to see they're going to be cast alive into the lake of fire. And when we think of the beast and the false prophet, what we see is the personification of faithfulness, faith, sorry, faithlessness, right? They, they didn't believe the word of God. They didn't believe any of the things concerning God. They were faithless. And also they were the personification of falsehood. Everything they did was a lie and a deception. And so in contrast to them, the one who is faithful and true is the one who is being revealed from heaven to destroy the faithless and the falsehood. It's interesting that we tend to have in our culture almost an emasculated view of the Lord Jesus. Mm. And uh, one person says this, any view of God which eliminates judgment and his hatred of sin in the interest of an emasculated doctrine of sentimental affection finds no support in the strong and virile realism of the apocalypse. Mm. Here's a God who judges and judges in righteousness. And the one who's being given the responsibility of judgment, being committed to him, is none other than the Lord Jesus. And here he comes to judge. And so it's good for us to remember that this dramatic display of judgment comes only at the end of a long time of grace and patience and mercy. God is not swift to come to judgment. When the Lord said, behold, I come quickly. And yet we know over 2,000 years have gone by. Why? Because God is long suffering, not willing that any should perish. And so he has given man lots of opportunity to repent. Grace, the period of grace has gone on and on. And, and the gospel opportunities have been endless. But now it's over. That patience and mercy have come to an end. Not rushing to judgment, but he now comes to judge a world hardened and totally given over to their rebellion against them. And what he does, he does it all in righteousness. The wars which he wages are from the principle of perfect righteousness. No selfish ambition here. This is just righteous judgment that is seen. The first time he came into this world, it says that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. But here, at the second advent, it says he comes to judge and to make war. No longer coming to seek and to save, but now coming expressly to judge and make war against the rebellious world that has become so hardened in its rebellion against him and his father. Notice it tells us as it describes this majestic sovereign riding on this white horse, it gives us four features of this majestic person. And it begins with his eyes. Verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire. And men will shrink from his gaze. It's interesting, I think of Peter when he had denied the Lord three times and the Lord came out of uh, Pilate's judgment hall, he said he just looked at him. Mm. Peter wept bitterly. Imagine what those eyes will be like, uh, burning like a, a flame of fire. Of course, uh, they're the first to discern the secrets of all hearts. There are no secrets here that Christ does not see. There's no lewd thought. There's no unbelieving skepticism that Christ does not read. There's no hypocrisy, no formalism, no deceit that he does not scan as easily as a man reads a page in a book. His eyes are like a flame of fire to read as through and through and know us to our innermost soul. And so he will come with eyes as a flame of fire. And then we think of his head. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. It's interesting, those eyes at his first advent that wept when they looked at Jerusalem 
will now come in blazing judgment. That head that once was formerly crowned with thorns in John 19 verse 5 is now crowned with many crowns. And of course, this is not the Stephanus, the victor's crown. These are diadems. Uh, again, that speaking of royalty, that in, it invested in him is the right to reign over all kings, to be the ultimate king of kings, as we're going to see the Lord of lords. He's crowned with many crowns. We often sing that beautiful hymn, crown him with many crowns, a lamb upon his throne. And of course, he will be crowned with many crowns. And so it tells us in verse 13, it says, oh, sorry, verse 12, his name. Uh, it says uh, he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now, we're going to think about that a little bit further when we get down uh, where it says in verse 13, his name is called the word of God. But again, one of the aspects of it uh, is that his name is going to be significant. We thought about his eyes, his head, his name. Let's look at his clothing, and then we'll come back to that name. His clothing, it says, again in verse 13, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. The word dipped here, it's the word we're very familiar with. It's the word baptizo. And so it's plunged in the blood of his enemies. That's the picture. Uh, I want you to go back with me to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. And I think we've mentioned before that when we talk about Armageddon, it's really the campaign of Armageddon rather than uh, just the simple battle of Armageddon. Because uh, before he touches down on the Mount of Olives, there will be other places that he sweeps through and visits uh, destroying and making war and so it says in isaiah 63 verse 1 who is this that cometh from edom with dyed garments from bosra and so many believe that he first come and deal with edom uh, from bosra this is the glory that that this that is glorious in his apparel traveling in the greatness of his strength I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and the garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people uh, there were none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And so the Lord, by the way, although he's accompanied by armies, he doesn't need the armies to help him win the battle. He actually does it all himself. Uh, they're not needed, just as he could have called 12 legions of angels, but they're not needed. The angel, the angelic armies will be there. They'll be there sharing in his triumph, but the, all the fighting will be done by the Lord. And so as he dashes his enemies to pieces, the, uh, as, he, as he treads the winepress of the wrath of God, as we saw back in Revelation chapter 14, the blood spatters on his garments. And so his garments clothed dipped, baptized, plunged in the blood of his enemies as he comes in the day of his vengeance. And so we talked about his, his name. And of course, it says here, his name is called the word of God. But of course, there are many names, aren't they, that describe no one name can fully, as it were, divulge all that there is in the person of the Lord Jesus. So there are many names that are connected with him. And one of them that we just read about previously here, uh, it says no man knew but he himself. And so what that would tell us is this, that there are depths of the Lord Jesus that the human mind cannot even begin to comprehend. In fact, it's going to take us all eternity mm -hmm. to just even learn about one aspect, one attribute of his character and that is the grace of the
Lord Jesus, right? The ages to come, we're going to be learning about the exceeding riches of his grace towards us in Christ Jesus. It's going to take the whole of eternity to learn that. So there's things about him that, again, we've, we've, we've said this often, but if, if God was small enough to be understood, he wouldn't be big enough to be worshipped. And so there are aspects of the divine person uh, of the Lord Jesus that nobody knows except he himself. Such are the depths uh, connected with him. But then there's another name that we're much more familiar with. It says his name is called the Word of God. Of course, the Word of God is is, is the logos, right? It's that vehicle of communication. It's how communication is made. And, and, and of course, the Lord Jesus is the one who has communicated fully the mind and heart of God. He is the one who has told him out. No one's seen God at any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. Uh, he is the one who fully expresses the mind and heart of God. And so his name is called the Word of God. Of course, when we think of him as the Word of God, at his first advent, he was revealed as the Word, wasn't he? And what did he reveal about God at his first advent? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We beheld his glory, even the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so at his first advent, there was a revelation of the infinite grace of God seen in the person of the Lord Jesus. At his second advent, again, the word of God will be revealing something of the character of God, telling it out, displaying it. And what is he going to be displaying this time? The fact of his infinite righteousness. His righteousness and his judgment is going to be revealed. And so his name is called the word of God. And of course, there's great power in that word. In fact, we're going to see that as we proceed in this chapter. And then it talks about the, the armies of heaven. Notice it says the armies plural. It doesn't say singular, the army of heaven, but the armies and that's important. We, we should always pay attention to the single and the plural when we look at scripture. And so it tells us that these armies of heaven who will share in his triumph, who will accompany him, they're comprised of different regiments, if we want to put it that way, different armies that come together. And so who are these armies? Well, look at chapter 17, Revelation chapter 17. And verse 14, it says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And of course, we believe that the, the, the Lord will be accompanied by the church. His bride will come with him. Uh, whether we like riding horses or not, there's a day coming that we will be riding a white horse following the Lord Jesus out of heaven uh, to his victory and, and sharing, as it were, in that victory. What a, what a day that will be, seeing uh, him, uh, as it were, exercise righteousness and judgment on the earth. And so certainly uh, it will include those that are truly the children of God. Uh, through faith in the Lord Jesus in this church age. But look with me, please, at the book of Jude, just back one book, and Jude verse 14. And we'll notice that one of the earliest recorded prophecies of the Bible, <laughs> Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, or holy ones, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. By the way, isn't that a tremendous scripture, really? You, you think of... Uh, the university campuses of Western civilization. You think of all the ungodly speeches 
that have been made by infidel professors who have tried to ridicule faith in the Lord Jesus. When he comes, <laughs> he was coming to execute judgment among them of all their ungodly deeds and speeches and all of the things that they have spoken against him. Oh, what a day. And by the way, what a, what a thrill it is for us that we have the, the inestimable privilege in a world that continues to deride that lovely name to speak well of him at every opportunity. Oh, let's take every opportunity to speak well of him because there are ungodly who constantly make ungodly spin sinners who speak against him. And then one other scripture, again, to show about these armies, and it's in First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, where we read, to the end he may establish your, uh, you unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And so we suggest to you that saints and angels comprise the armies that will accompany the Lord Jesus out of heaven. Those redeemed by precious blood and the elect angels that have not rebelled against him will comprise this amazing army. And then it says in chapter 19, verse 15, it says, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. Now I want to just look at the old Testament background to this particular scripture. Christ acts and conquers by his word, this sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the sharp sword that comes out of his mouth. Isaiah 49 and verse 2, this is part of the servant songs of the book of Isaiah. And so we, we read this. Um, uh, let's begin in verse 1. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver, hath he hid me, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in which I will be glorified. Of course, the Lord Jesus, the true Israelite, coming with the sharp sword to crush his enemy. So that's the Old Testament background. But we said that Christ is going to act and conquer by his word. And again, just a couple of references that show this Second Thessalonians again. So I know we're going to look into a lot of scriptures this morning, but that's good. Good practice for us to see just how all the word of God is coming together at this moment. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse eight. It says, then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The law shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And then back in the book of Isaiah, once again, chapter 11, Isaiah 11 and verse four. It says, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove, reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Sword of his mouth, rod of iron, because ruling with a rod of iron is the idea of he would rule um, in two ways. Uh, first of all, uh, we, we saw back in Psalm 2 about this rod of iron, that when the nations rage against the Lord and against his anointed, it says in verse 8 and 9, Ask of me, and I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And of course, I think the idea is this rod, it's kind of like the, the shepherd's rod. Uh, it, you know how the shepherd's rod had a twofold purpose. Uh, one was for the sheep. 
thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. But the other was for the decimation of the wolves and all those that attacked. And so the Lord, as the great shepherd, is going to put the wolves to flight and destroy them in a destructive way, the enemies of the sheep. And at the same time, he's going to use the same rod to comfort those that are truly his sheep. Now, we just think about the power of the word of the Lord Jesus. So remember when they came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, this huge contingent of soldiers. And all the Lord Jesus did was say this, I am. And what happened to them? You know the story well. They all fell on the deck. They all fell backwards. They just completely hit the deck. And all he simply said was, I am. Remember, this is the word that spoke the worlds into existence. Said, let there be light. There was light. This is the word that holds the world together by the word of his mouth. Oh, what power is in the word of the Lord Jesus. And of course, he tells us the day is going to come that all are in the graves will hear his voice. <laughs> All right, he's going to empty the graves. He, I mean, that's the power of the, the, the word of the Lord Jesus. And so here he is, crowned with many crowns, coming out of heaven. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Now, it's interesting. This, um, the idea is that Jesus holds a sword in his mouth like a buccaneer, uh, or that he is spitting swords. It's a dramatic way of referring to the power of his word. Christ conquers by the power of his word. Five times in the book of Revelation, John emphasizes that Jesus' sword comes out of his mouth. This is his weapon. It's, it's the power of his word. So we're just going to look at the five references very quickly. Uh, Revelation 1, verse 16, first time. We see it mentioned, he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And then in chapter 2 and verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write these things, saith he, which hath the sharp sword, with two edges, clearly a reference back to chapter 1, verse 16. Chapter 2, verse 16, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And then, of course, this reference in Revelation 19 and verse 15, and then verse 21, he and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And so five references to this sharp sword that comes out of his mouth. And so then it says in verse 16, And he hath on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You remember when he was... Here at his first advent, Pilate asked him the question, Art thou a king then? John 18, 37. And of course, um, Pilate, so let me just look back there in John's gospel, chapter 19 now, and what Pilate did in response uh, to the Lord Jesus. And he says in verse 14 of John 19, he says, and it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. He saith unto the Jews, behold, your king. And they cried out away with him, uh, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. They took Jesus, led him away, and he bearing his cross went forth unto a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it 
on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And of course, he was the king of Israel when he revealed himself in to Nathaniel in John chapter one. Nathaniel rightly said, thou art the king of Israel. And he is. Revelation 15, three, we saw he's the king of saints. Psalm 24, verse seven says he's the king of glory. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. And of course, we know he's the prince of peace. He's the prince of life, Acts 3.15. And now he's proclaimed to be the king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus comes to rule and to reign in triumph. To rule the nations with a rod of iron, as predicted in Psalm 2. He comes as king of kings to displace every king reigning on the earth and to be the ultimate authority on the planet. Of course, it's amazing how some misguided Bible scholars think that uh, this uh, all happens not by Christ coming in direct intervention, but by the preaching of preaching of the gospel, they talk about the leavening of existing governments with Christian principles, the spiritual conversion of countries and empires, uh, leaving them in existence and simply Christianizing them so as to exhibit something of Christ's spirit in their administrations. But that is not what this passage is saying. Christ is coming. He's coming to make war. He's coming to put down all rebellion, all authority, and he will be proclaimed through through conflict, through victory. He will be claimed the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he will be given that rightful place. He's the only one who is going to take that position in that place. So now we come to really what the title of our message is all about this supper of the great god and so it says in verse 17 i saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great god so the angels summoned the birds to attend the supper in the east the vultures and other birds of prey gathered in a field of battle to feast on the dead bodies after the conflict was over. This will be the most terrible massacre to ever befall mankind. Men who have rejected the truth and followed the liar to their destruction will indeed be there, there uh, to pro pro provide a, a, a huge feast for all the scavenger birds that are being called together to this supper. What a difference between being called to the bridal supper of the Lamb as opposed to being part of this supper of the great God. God provides for his son and his bride a marriage supper of joy. Satan provides his followers a feast for the unclean birds of the earth. Now, there are different suppers we know that are described in the Bible. There's the, the, the supper of salvation alluded to in Jesus' parable uh, in Luke's gospel, chapter 14. Let me just read that, uh, this invitation to the gospel supper, as it were. Luke 14, verse 16. It says, he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuses and cause the world full of excuses. And they go through their various excuses. It says, verse 21, so the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, bring in hither the poor and the maimed, the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done. And as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. The Lord said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house might be filled. Boy, isn't that a, 
this is the heart of God. There's no idea, thought here of a God who just wants a, a tiny number that he has decided before the world began to be saved. He wants his house filled. Go and invite them in. Tell them to come. The highways and hedges. Call them to come in. And so the supper of salvation. And then, of course, for those that come to that supper of salvation and that respond to the invitation, those that whoever calls on the name of the Lord are saved, Who, whosoever believes on him will, will, will experience the remission of sins. And so what do they do? Well, they enjoy a supper. They commemorate the Lord's Supper so that they don't ever forget what was done for them on that cruel cross of Calvary. And they do this in remembrance of him. And then, of course, there's the marriage supper of the Lamb. We've already thought about that. And then this final supper, the supper of the great God. And if I could put it this way, if you reject the first supper, the gospel invitation, the second supper will mean nothing to you. The Lord's Supper won't have any value to you. And you will not be present at the third supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But you will be present at the fourth supper. Everybody gets to attend at least one of these suppers. Some will eat and others will be eaten. So very, very sobering. Now, here's an interesting thing. If we want to consider this just for a minute, I'd like you to go back to the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel in chapter 39, because there's definite similarities in another battle that's described, what we call the Battle of Gog and Magog. And in Ezekiel 39, 17, it says, Thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bullocks, all of the fatlings of Bashan. And you shall eat fat till you be full and drink blood till you be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. And because of the similarities between Ezekiel 39 and here in Revelation chapter 19, some have concluded that actually uh, the Gog and Magog battle is all part of this big battle that we call Armageddon. However, I would counter that and say that actually these two are separate battles and one begins is at the beginning of the tribulation, one is at the end of the tribulation. And the reason I would say that is birds eat more than once every seven years. <laughs> no problem having a feast as the Lord defeats the armies of the Gog and, uh, Gog and Magog. And how does he do that? In a different way, a great earthquake. And then, of course, there's fire brimstone falling down from heaven. Here it's the Lord Jesus defeating the armies of the earth. Very different contexts and two different suppers where feeding will take place. Now, verse 18, it says that you may eat the flesh. I want you to notice five times the word flesh is going to be used. You may eat the flesh of kings. This is back in Revelation 19. The flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, of them that sit on them, the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And so there's a great repetition of this idea of flesh. The sword of the Lord, wielded by a mightier than Gideon, wields a terrible toll on the earth. And by the way, we might say this battle, the issue was never in doubt. How could the creature, in his foolishness, expect to defeat the creator? But the repetition of flesh is somewhat significant. I, I like this quote by Donald Gray Barnhouse. He says this, the race has walked in carnal enmity against God, living after the flesh, and now the days of his patience is at an end. And it isn't interesting, isn't it? The carnal mind is at enmity against God. That word carnal comes from the word, well, chili con carne, chili with meat, <laughs> fleshly. And so 
the fleshly men of the earth become the food of the birds. By the way, it shows that all men of all stations will be judged, the high and the low together. If they remain hardened in their rejection of Jesus, they will be judged. The divine judgment upon the wicked is no respecter of persons or stations and is a great equalizer of all. Yes, they'll be slaves, they'll be free, they'll be kings, they'll be captains, they'll just be ordinary foot soldiers, but they will all be the food at this supper. And we might say this, that not only is concerning divine judgment of the wicked, God no respecter of persons, but when it comes to the whosoever will gospel, he's no respecter of persons either. Whosoever will may come. Whether they're highly intellectual, whether they're simple saints, it doesn't matter. Whoever believes on him will not be confounded. And so verse 19, it says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Some have suggested, in, and we've mentioned this before, that the armies from the east and, and the man of sin's armies really fight each other and then they kind of unite to fight together the Lord. Uh, I don't see that at all in scripture. I don't see any evidence that those that are coming from the east are coming to fight against the man of sin. They're all coming to fight against the Lord. This, why are the heathen raging? Why are the people imagining? You talk about imagining a vain thing. Let us cast their cords asunder. Let's break their bounds. And so here they are. And, and again, it's just, it's ironic, really, the incurable insanity of sin, which wars away against God, despite the impossibility of ever winning. And that's what man does. And so foolish man tries to form armies to fight against the Lord from heaven. And of course, they're not successful. They come to make war. John writes, no description about a battle. This is entirely a one-sided affair, more of a simple act of judgment than a prolonged battle or war. He just, well, God's laughing at them. And the Lord Jesus speaks and they are conquered and defeated. And I want you to notice what he does in verse 20. And I, I love this because he arrests the ringleaders without warning. He seizes them with hostile intent. And the great host is left leaderless. They are hurled alive, these leaders, into the lake of fire. Look at verse 20. The beast was taken. And with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them and had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Now, isn't it interesting that um, the Lord, we read in, in earlier in scripture that there were two individuals who were taken to heaven without dying enoch and elijah now we read of two individuals who were thrown into the lake of fire without dying the beast and the false prophet what's also interesting is that the normal process for somebody is they die uh, they go to hades and they await their trial and judgment and then they're cast into the lake of fire we'll see that when we look at chapter 20 but here no trial needed. It's obvious of their guilt. And so without trial, they are cast alive into the lake of fire. And by the way, the lake of fire was originally, as we know, made for the devil and his angels. It was not intended for man to go there. But because man has believed the deception and lies of the devil, mm -hmm. They share in his fate. And so these who have been deceiving the world, in a sense, they're paying an ultimate price, aren't they? 
they were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. By the way, later on, chapter 20, Satan is going to be cast in to the lake of fire after the thousand years are over. And it says where the beast and the false prophet are. There's no question that scripture teaches eternal torment of the wicked. 1,000 years and there's no prospect of parole or early release or just being even annihilated. They will continue to be there throughout the ages of the ages because sin against an eternal God has eternal consequences. And so, not thrown into Hades to await judgment and trial, but directly into the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. And so it says, the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all of the fowls were filled with their flesh. James 1.15 says this, Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That's exactly what's happened. This is sin when it's finished. Oh, the folly. Oh, the deceptiveness of sin. Of thinking we can do things and get away with it without consequence. Mm. God and the Lord Jesus, well, faithful and true and in righteousness, he does judge and make war. Sobering words may it stir our souls to be more faithful mm. in the gospel presentation. Let's encourage people to come to the gospel supper, <laughs> including on Sunday night there in Moncton for the beginning of the gospel meetings. But the eternal gospel supper, go to the highways and byways. Let's compel them to come in. Amen.